Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and she's a bit camera shy at the moment, but probably at some stage in this video, you'll see Julie Oliver and she's a dog. Just over a week ago, Dr. John Campbell made a video about the incidence of myocarditis following COVID vaccination. The video contains a number of errors and fails to put the risk into perspective by not covering COVID risks. Now, John does sometimes correct mistakes in future videos, so I thought I would give him some time to do that. But it's been just over a week now, so I think it's time to correct the record for him. John's video is primarily about this paper, which was published in JAMA. The paper specifically covers myocarditis cases reported after mRNA-based COVID-19 vaccination in the US from December 2020 to August 2021. And it's a very solid, good quality paper, which quantifies the risk and shows that for young men in particular, the risk of myocarditis following vaccination, whilst rare, is definitely real. The paper also compares myocarditis following vaccination with myocarditis following viral infections and says the following. Cases of myocarditis reported after COVID-19 vaccination were typically diagnosed within days of vaccination, whereas cases of typical viral myocarditis can often have indolent courses with symptoms sometimes present for weeks to months after a trigger if the cause is ever identified. The major presenting symptoms appeared to resolve faster in cases of myocarditis after COVID-19 vaccination than in typical viral cases of myocarditis. Even though almost all individuals with cases of myocarditis were hospitalised and clinically monitored, they typically experienced symptomatic recovery after receiving only pain management. In contrast, typical viral cases of myocarditis can have a more variable clinical course. For example, up to 6% of typical viral myocarditis cases in adolescents require a heart transplant or result in mortality. So in other words, myocarditis cases following COVID vaccination are generally mild in contrast to myocarditis following viral infections. Interestingly, John doesn't cover this in his video, but that's fair enough. It's a long paper. He can't cover everything. He does cover other information from the paper. And if he'd actually stopped there, it would have been fine. But he didn't. He went on to suggest that the information in the paper was seriously undercounting the real risk of myocarditis. And it was actually much worse. So let's take a look. This is from Sarah. Uh, John, please could you review this article from Israel's National News? It says the risk of myocarditis following mRNA COVID vaccine is around 133 times greater than the background risk. Is this true? Um, and if it is true, why is it not all over mainstream media? Well, to deal with that last bit first, um, I don't know why mainstream media don't seem to report on these things more than they do. You would think it would be a legitimate part of informed comment. So I don't know the answer to that one. You'd have to ask the director general of the various mainstream media outlets and their people in charge. So John doesn't know why mainstream media aren't covering this information. I'd say the most likely reason is because it's not true. The claim that the risk is 133 times greater than the background risk didn't, doesn't come from the paper and can't even be calculated from the paper. So why would mainstream media be covering it? But on myocarditis following vaccination, mainstream media has covered this extensively. And this is just one example from the BBC. Heart Inflammation Linked to Pfizer and Moderna Jabs by James Gallagher, published on the 9th of July, 2021. So the result, now remember amongst this 192 million uh, people vaccinated, 354 million doses of vaccine, but most of these vaccines, of course, were given to people over the age of uh, 30. So it's a bit it's a bit misleading that. So you know, if we looked, actually looked at the number of um, vaccinated people in that age group, it will probably be better because, as we say, the older people are essentially at no risk of this complication. So a bit disappointing they didn't break that number down further, really. Uh, th th this, this would tend to make the cases look uh, 
rarer th th than they are because this is th these are the cases for the whole population not that particular demographic which was unfortunate that they, they chose to express it like that. This information comes from the first paragraph of the results section and providing top level results like this is a pretty typical way of starting your results discussion. The information that John seems to think is missing is actually provided later. The paper provides the rates of myocarditis per million doses for all age groups broken down by vaccine type and first or second dose. Adolescent males 12 to 15, 70.7 uh, million doses of the vaccine given and uh, so 70, sorry, 70 Point seven cases of myocarditis per million cases of vaccine given. So nearly 71 cases per million vaccine given. And I've worked that out as one case in 14,144. Um, but again, many of the people that were vaccinated were much older. And it's not clear, the, the paper's actually not clear whether it's just comparing within its demographic or for everyone. So not not really clear on that. Actually, the paper is completely clear. It's in the methods section if you understand what you were reading. It says the rates are stratified by age, sex, vaccination dose and vaccination type, which means the numbers are for the demographic and the cases are per million doses given in that actual age group. At males aged 16 to 17, uh, 105.9 cases per million doses. Uh, that's that's one case for 9,442. But if we just look at the demographic, I think that would be a fair bit higher, is, is my understanding, is my reading of this paper. No, the number isn't higher than that. As I said in the last section, it's the correct number. John's reading of the paper is wrong. Males 18 to 24, um, 52.8. Four million per million doses. That's one case in nineteen thousand, um, and uh, fifty-six point three. Actually, in that particular age group, it's a bit confusing. There, let's go. Let's go by the graphic. That is what it says in the paper, but the graphic indicates that that's not correct. So I'm not quite sure if that's just a fault in the way the paper's written. Needless to say, they haven't made a mistake. This is the figure that I think John is referring to. And it shows the number of people who got myocarditis after the vaccine based on the number of days since they got the vaccine. The figure on the left is the Pfizer and the figure on the right is the Moderna. John seems to be thinking that because more people who got Pfizer had myocarditis, the rate should be higher than for Moderna. But he's forgetting that more people actually had the Pfizer vaccine in the first place. Now, I don't know how much detail to go into today, but this, this is the supplement that we get. So I'm just going to mention this a little bit because there are some causes for concern here. So presence of one or more new worsening of the following clinical symptoms, chest pain, pressure or discomfort, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, pain with breathing, feeling your heart beat inside your chest, palpitation, syncope is, is fainting. But as well as that, you need to have a histio histiopath pathological confirmation. Now, th this would only be detected on post-mortem because I really can't imagine they're doing cardiac biopsies. So histiopathology, of course, is where you look at the heart under the microscope or some of the tissues under the microscope. And the idea that you would do that in a, in, in a living person is, I've never seen it done. Um, maybe some centres do it. So if you're a clinician working in the States and you do do cardiac biopsies on, on living patients, then do let me know. But um, I will be surprised. So, um, but if, if they didn't have that, which they probably wouldn't, then they would need an MRI. So it's, it's getting quite difficult to get to be a confirmed case. So you have to have the presence of one or more of these, fair enough. But then you have to have that, which would probably never happen. Uh, or you have to have an MRI, which can be difficult to obtain. Uh so you had to have a cardiac magnetic resonance imaging finding consistent with myocarditis and troponins. So they're kind of making it a little difficult. And It took me about 10 seconds to find out that cardiac biopsies are done on living people. And here's an article that explains how they're done. 
it actually specifically says that one of its uses is to confirm myocarditis, which makes sense because they would hardly have it down as a way to confirm a case if it wasn't used at all. Now, I suspect it isn't used very often. And likewise, we know from reading the paper that only a proportion of people got an MRI, but that doesn't really matter in the context of this paper because the myocarditis figures they quote are both confirmed and probable cases. To be a probable cause, you need those same things as well. Probable case, rather. So those same clinical criteria. And... Um, you also need troponin levels above the upper limit, fair enough, uh, an abnormal ECG or, or, or uh, rhythm um, consistent with myocarditis, abnormal cardiac function or wall motion, as we said, with MRI or sometimes ultrasound scan uh, or, or, or MRI findings. So they're making it quite difficult and, and to eliminate cases. So you could say they're being exacting, but that, that could mean that some people that are this could mean that some people with, say, mildly inflamed myocardiums aren't being put forward as a probable or confirmed case. It could mean that. To be a probable case, you only need to have one of the four findings listed in Section 2. Now, I'm not a cardiologist, so I could be wrong, but it doesn't seem to me that that's a particularly high bar to jump. After all, you need to have some evidence to say it's myocarditis. Even a mild case should have some sign. Otherwise, how would you know? So if this complication comes up, or any complication comes up from the vaccine, people can decide to fill out this VERAS form or not. Well, if you're a member of the general public, you have the option to make a report or not. But if you're a healthcare provider, you are required by law to make a VERAS report for any serious adverse events, regardless of whether you think the vaccine caused the adverse event. And they define serious adverse events as the following. Death, a life-threatening adverse event, inpatient hospitalisation or prolongation of existing hospitalisation, uh, persistent or significant incapacity or substantial disruption of the ability to conduct normal life functions, a congenital anomaly or birth defect, or an important medical event that, based on appropriate medical judgment, may jeopardise the individual and may require medical or surgical intervention to prevent one of the outcomes listed above. So medical providers are legally required to report myocarditis as well as any other serious adverse event. Now, it's possible that some healthcare providers may choose to break the law and not report events, so there is potentially some underreporting, but I suspect most healthcare providers are law-abiding. Now, reports on the, uh, the VERAS system, it says this on the VERAS website here. Uh, the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System is a passive reporting system, meaning it relies on individuals to send in reports of their experiences. Anyone can submit a report to VERAS, including parents and patients. So anyone can do it. Or can they? Because let me just show you the form that needs to be filled out. Now... Here we have part of the form here. Um, part of the form. So um, you would have to decide whether there's any anaphylaxis, coagulopathy, COVID-19, death, Guillain-Barre syndrome, Kawasaki disease, uh, multisystem inflammatory system in adults, multisystem inflammatory system in children, myocardial infarction, uh, myopericarditis, narcolepsy, pregnancy, seizure, stroke, transverse myelitis or other. Now, this is not a, a quiz, but uh, how many members of the public would know what the heck that was talking about? Uh, also, you asked, uh, they'd asked you to identify other infections. So the member of the public, it would appear, is expected to know whether the infection was a DNA virus, Coxsackie, Coxsackie virus. I mean, how could you know any of this stuff? You, you know, it's, it's all specialised stuff. Ejection, fraction, you know, all these things, how would you know them? So how on earth a member of the public could fill out one of these forms? Well, they couldn't. I don't see how they could. I just don't get it. Now, I imagine viewers watching this segment and nodding their heads and saying, 
John is right. We don't know what all these things mean. Obviously, members of the general public can't possibly fill out a VAERS form. And I must admit, I did try out a few of these words on Julie and she didn't have a clue what I was talking about. But here's the thing. Although John claimed he was showing part of a VAERS form, he wasn't. Nothing that he showed in this segment actually came from a VAERS form. He basically spent several minutes making an argument based on misinformation. And the whole segment was even longer than what I've shown you. I shortened it a bit so it wouldn't get too boring. This is the real VAERS form. And I'll provide a link to the VAERS website so you can check it out for yourself. As well as a form which can either be filled out online or via PDF. There are also instructions on how to fill it out in case any section isn't clear. The form starts out by asking for some basic information on the patient, which would be you if you are filling it out for yourself. And these are things people typically would know about themselves. Name and address, date of birth, date you got the vaccination, date the adverse event started, any other medication you were taking, any allergies, any illnesses you've had at the time of vaccination, and any chronic or long-standing health conditions. This section asks for some information on the person filling out the report, as well as the facility where the vaccine was given. All pretty straightforward. This section gets into the nitty gritty. Here you provide more details about the vaccine you received, as well as the adverse events you had. But you'll know there are no complicated words here. Just a box where you can describe the adverse event in your own words. This is the final section of the form and here they ask for information about any other vaccines taken as well as additional demographic and military service information and that's it. What I've just gone over is the whole form. Nothing that John claimed was on the form is actually there. Now maybe I'm overestimating people's intelligence but I would have thought most people would find this form pretty straightforward. Julie would struggle with it, but that's because her paws are too big to hit the individual letters on the keyboard. And to be honest, she can't read. Very good at uh, ripping up toys, though, and making a complete mess of the floor. What is really funny, though, is I was reading through the comments on John's video and I came across quite a few people claiming to be healthcare providers and agreeing with John that the form was way too complicated and that they themselves struggled to fill it out. Clearly, these people are just making stuff up because if they were really healthcare providers, they would have known that John wasn't presenting the information on the VAERS form. And if you're wondering where John got the information that he presented as being on the VAERS form, it came from this form here, which is in the appendix of the paper. What this form actually is, is the form used by the paper's authors to collect further information on the VAERS reports. And they filled out the form after reviewing the patient's medical records or interviewing their doctors. So John has somehow misunderstood and thought this was the actual VAERS form. Okay, a bit complicated today, so um hope you followed that. So we, we can we can we can say that there's more myocarditis. Uh, it's increased after vaccination. And uh, the hundred and thirty-three figure times hundred and thirty-three figure we don't have data for, the times eighty-four figure we do in that particular age group. But for the reasons I've mentioned, it's probably more than hundred and thirty-three times. So um what I would appeal um, is uh, for this to be covered more on mainstream media so that people can make informed decisions. Well, as we've discussed, none of John's arguments as to why the myocarditis risk is much higher than suggested by the paper are valid. But he is right that people should make informed decisions. But to make an informed decision, you also need to look at the risks associated with actually getting COVID without being protected by a vaccine. So let's have a look at that now. This study looks specifically at patients aged 12 to 30, and they compared the risk of myocarditis following vaccination with the risk following COVID if you were unvaccinated. 
And to do this, they reviewed records from COSMOS, which is a data set of more than 126 million patients from 889 hospitals and 19,420 clinics across all 50 states in the US. So this is what they found. In the 30 days following vaccination, the risk of myocarditis was 8.6 per 100,000 patients. And they included all three vaccinations available at the time here, Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J. In comparison, in the 30 days following a COVID diagnosis, the risk of myocarditis was 145.2 per 100,000 patients. And this was specifically unvaccinated people who caught COVID. This corresponds to almost 17 times the risk. So if you are concerned about myocarditis, you should get vaccinated. By the way, the blue bar is the incidence of myocarditis in 2019, but it's actually the annual figure. So it's not directly comparable with the other figures on the chart because they are only 30 days after vaccination or infection and not really sure why they put it there, but it's their paper. Of course, myocarditis isn't the only heart problem you can get after COVID. In this study, which is published in Nature Medicine, they look at cardiovascular complications over a period of 12 months following COVID for 153,760 individuals. And they compared the risk with two sets of control cohorts, a historical cohort from before the pandemic and a contemporary cohort of people with no evidence of SARS-CoV-2. They looked at a number of different cardiovascular complications, and in every case, the risk was increased following COVID. And you can see a summary of the results here. The chart on the left is the hazard ratio, and anything to the right of the dotted line means an increased risk. The chart on the right shows the excess burden per 1,000 people. And remember, the JAMA study looking at myocarditis following vaccination was reporting cases per million doses. So the rates of heart issues following COVID are several orders of magnitude higher. If you're not familiar with the terms, cerebrovascular disorders include things like stroke, dysrhythmia, includes a number of conditions where the heart doesn't beat properly, including atrial fibrillation. Inflammatory heart disease includes myocarditis and pericarditis. So as you can see, your increased risk continues even after you've recovered from COVID. Ischemic heart disease includes things like heart attack and angina. Thrombotic disorders are conditions involving blood clots. And MAY stands for Major Adverse Cardiovascular Event and includes all-cause mortality, stroke and myocardial infarction. And of course, COVID doesn't just affect the cardiovascular system. It is also associated with an increase in mental illness, Julianne Barre syndrome, long COVID and erectile dysfunction. And I will provide some links in the video's description to some papers about the risks if you want to learn more. I was planning to discuss the papers, but the video is getting a bit long. There is one more potential outcome from COVID that I would like to discuss, however and that's death. Now, we know that the risk of dying from COVID for young people is low, but low risk is not no risk. This table shows how many people in the USA under the age of 30 have died from COVID, and I've broken it down further by age group and sex. Now, compared with the total number of people who have died from COVID overall, these numbers are much lower. However, in absolute terms, 6,500 people under 30 dead from COVID is a lot. That's more than five times the number of people under 30 who were reported as having myocarditis in the JAMA study, and those people didn't die. In summary, myocarditis is a real risk following vaccination with mRNA vaccines, and the risk is higher in young males under 30. However, it is usually treatable and if you're unvaccinated, the risk of myocarditis following COVID infection is 17 times higher than the risk following vaccination for those under 30. And the risk of dying from COVID if you are unvaccinated is also higher than the myocarditis risk, even for under 30s. 
Now, this doesn't mean the risk of myocarditis following vaccination should be dismissed. It's important to be aware of it and to be on the lookout for symptoms so you can get early treatment. The symptoms you should look out for are chest pain, shortness of breath, and palpitations. And remember, these conditions don't just occur after vaccination or COVID. They can have many causes. So you should never ignore these symptoms, no matter when they occur. It is also worth mentioning that you can reduce your risk of myocarditis following vaccination by increasing the interval between doses. If you'd like to look further into the data I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. Thank you for listening. If you found this video useful, please hit the like button so that more people will see it. And if you'd like to see more videos about the science in the future, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.